what common bad choices slash downfalls do you see in archives and small historical societies? And how can they be avoided? So love the question and love that you are solutions oriented. So from what I have seen, first and foremost, the very first thing that came to mind was scarcity mindset. If you are not familiar, scarcity mindset is when people and or organizations are constantly in a mode and constantly make decisions based on a lack of. The lack of can be literal or perceived, and it's usually a lack of or interpreting a lack of money slash resources. And so with that scarcity mindset tends to breed a lot of internal competition, jealousy, um, some, some toxic environment kind of stuff uh, within organizations because there's the not enough to go around feeling or uh, belief in those situations. Um, part of this is situational. Uh, it could very well be that there's not enough money to go around, but I have found that the people who set the tone in the organization and the emotional health of the organization, so both managers and administrative staff, but also uh, staff and colleagues that tend to take more leadership roles, whether informally or formally, they're the ones that can influence this mindset for better or worse. And so Unfortunately, especially at smaller shops and ones that are run uh, by people who maybe aren't experienced or have a, a schooling or an experienced background to be running small shops, it can be very difficult. And that's where we tend to find the scarcity mindset. How to work around or get out of that, um, trying to manage up is one of the strategies there realizing that there is restrictions on just how much we have control over um, trying to separate yourself and create some boundaries so that you are not getting sucked into that feeling and are able to start forming and finding your own solutions to your problems to get the resources you need so for example that's one of the main reasons i taught myself how to do grant writing because i needed money to do the projects we were supposed to be doing so um, making sure that you're carving out a space for yourself where you can do that solution uh, creation and solution planning and are not being impacted by this mindset. Uh, next one, blinders or tunnel vision. And this is where, again, with the smaller shops especially, or for organizations no matter what size, that are chronically understaffed, it can be very easy for particularly management to get very uh, overwhelmed in a state of overwhelm and start developing tunnel vision or I always imagine horse blinders. And so they can only literally see what is in front of them instead of the whole landscape of what it is they're supposed to be in charge of and stewarding. And with that mode in mind, not only does that perpetuate the scarcity mindset because you're only working on like one thing at a time, it also prevents you from doing any sort of creative thinking, collaborating with other partners, uh, noticing affinities or opportunities, that kind of thing. So in order to help combat this, first of all, realize that you are doing it or that your boss is doing it and finding ways to break out of it, um, uh, particularly bringing on staff that have a project management capacity certainly helps at least with the logistics of that as well as doing very periodic check-ins so you know if you've got annual goals and a report break those down into quarterly and monthly check-ins and reports in terms of what are your priorities how are they going and don't lose track of them and sort of help pull you out of whatever the sort of the urgency tunnel vision that is happening. Next one, staff overworked and underappreciated. And for, for me, taking care of staff not only is the literal job of your boss and manager, but it is also their ethical responsibility to make sure that you as humans and you as human resources are taken care of and have the things that you need 
to be productive in your job, but to also function at your best capacity, to be healthy, and to even be happy. Um, that, is, <laughs> that is something that we should have in our workforce. And unfortunately, and again, I don't know, for many of these, uh, these setups, the managers tend to be those that were promoted or put in positions where they are in charge of people, but have never received nor sought out training for how to actually take care of those people. Now, part of this is on whoever promoted them, but most of this is on them for never seeking out the education and experience that they obviously need. Uh, unfortunately, this is very predominant, especially in our field uh, and related fields where people that are in these positions that are supposed to be taking care of their staff uh, have sort of that inferiority complex and fear uh, imposter syndrome, which is something we all suffer from, but it's not an excuse in their case. And so trying to break through that, especially knowing that there's that that fraud fear for them is difficult. Um, I wish I had a better solution for this one. My advice to you, because you are likely not a manager in this position, is to not, uh, not take it. Um, if your manager is overworking you and or you're being underappreciated, Make sure that you're being vocal about that, um, especially for the overworked component. What is it that is actually on your job description? Um, maybe even quantifying the hours and the projects that you're working on and showing the math that it is literally impossible for you to work on all of those things and that you are not being paid for overtime or um, work outside the office. And for the underappreciated part, this if you're a good boss, then you, your employees and staff should know how much they are appreciated every day. Uh, for the staff that I have supervised and currently supervise, I say, I say thank you every day for whatever it is that they have worked on. If they've turned in something and it's amazing and exactly what I need, just being very free with the acknowledgement and the affirmation that the work that they are doing is critical to you doing your job. Now, if you're the employee in this situation and not the manager, if you are not getting it from them, seek it out elsewhere. And also don't be afraid to um, communicate and be proud of your own accomplishments within your organization. So for example, this was a really bad problem at my first job for many reasons. Um, and so, <laughs> I had to toot my own horn, which is something that one of the staff um, had reflected to me at that point in time, but that it was so necessary because the things that we tend to do and work on, especially in larger organizations, are chronically underappreciated. So uh, praise yourself, be very um, transparent and vocal about your accomplishments work with your peers and maybe outside committees that would be more appreciative, but um, be someone who provides it to yourself and, and find avenues to seek it from others. Next one, lack of investment in people and tools. So again, your staff, they are literal human resources that you need to get the organization moving and, and maintained. And just the lack of investment, I mean, if you've seen some of my other webinars, you know that our field is not in a healthy position, uh, in this case financially, and that people are chronically underpaid, not only for the expertise and education, but also for where they live and cost of living, let alone things like, you know, student uh, investment in your education, so student loan debt, et cetera. So we need to pay people more is my point here. And we need to be better about that, not only because, again, it's an ethical as well as a, a professionally mandated thing, but also because if you pay people more, their worth, so it's not just more paying people their worth, period, then they will tend to stick around longer, they will be happier, they will be more productive. There are so many business cases and psychological reasons as to why you should be paying people their worth. 
and tools, of course. We need the right tools to do our job. And the better the tools are, the better we can do our job. And most of the time, the more time we save when we have the right tools. For example, having a really great collections management system that can automate things, um, can help you do batch or bulk workloads versus a not great collections management system can really make a huge difference time wise in terms of what your staff have to do um, and can make their lives better. And then the last one that I tend to see is missing expertise and skill sets. Again, when we're in these smaller shops or if we're in um, where there's not a lot of finances to go to bring on staff and or consultants, museums, archives, historical societies are still trying to do all of the jobs they think they're supposed to be doing. But if they don't have that expertise or skill set, they first of all, don't have any business doing it uh, and shouldn't be doing it for fear of damaging the collections. And second of all, that you need people who know how to do it. Otherwise, you're asking people to do things they don't know how to do that will take more time, there will be mistakes, etc. It's just not um, a good way to run any sort of collection management program. So those are the things that I tend to see the most. And while some of them are systemic and are not things we have full control over, hopefully I've been able to provide some insight and strategy for how to deal with those.